I'm going to start with you, Andrew, um, because I think when people think of the high Arctic, they think first of all of ice, and that is what your research with Smart Ice is focused on. What are some of the biggest changes that you've observed to the ice over your lifetime, and, uh, and what do those changes mean for the community up there? <clears throat> well, thanks, thanks for having me uh, with the uh, session here. Uh, with regarding your questions, uh, even in my own lifetime, I, I'm seeing changes of uh, ice conditions. Uh, <clears throat> the ice, sea ice is forming a little later each year and breaking up a little each year. And <clears throat> our community need to be aware of that because um, like you said, there was there is no connecting roads to our neighboring community, and we use the uh, sea ice as our main highway to get to our neighboring communities, our hunting grounds, camping grounds, and just to get away from the from the community. Shelley, you're a longtime resident of Pond Inlet, although you're not from there originally. You're also an anthropologist. You teach environmental technology. What are what are the big changes that you've observed? Well, I, I think the easiest way to to describe not just the changes, but why the changes matter. I, you know, I, I could give you a list and I'm sure you you're all really familiar with them, you know, melting permafrost, melting ice, shorter ice season. But but I think something to keep in mind is that as an anthropologist, I, I I know that every culture is a reflection of a specific environment, which means as an environment changes, so too does a culture. And, and this is something that we need to be hyper concerned about because the depth of knowledge that Inuit have about their environment means that as that environment changes, so too does the culture. Yeah, Alex, let me bring you in on that because you know, you're a member of Ikarvik, which is a, a group we're going to talk about in a second that's very connected with this climate science, but you are also um, an elementary school counselor in Pond Inlet. So you have direct contact with the kids, with the families. Tell us how some of the climate change that you're seeing is, is affecting people sort of from a sociological perspective. From a sociological perspective, it just encompasses a lot of pre-planning ahead. So for example, if you just need to figure out, okay, the sea ice is melting earlier, therefore, do we need to get our gear ready? Do we need to save up some money for more food? Do we need to have more ammunition to go hunting? There's just a lot of pre-planning within their own families, but it, it trickles down to the children as well, where they have some knowledge to the pre-planning or any sort of thing that they need to kind of be vigilant about. It's just another, it's just another layer of worry that they already have with their schoolwork with the children. And then another added layer from the families who are either working a nine to five or who are full-time hunters is just, there's so many ways to think about it. All you have to do is just think about the bigger picture and how you can trickle down the, the effects and how you're able to think about it. And, and so obviously, like a, a goal of climate science, we tend to, to write about it often in terms of what it means for the big picture. But there's also the idea of, of mitigation, of adaptation, of trying to do science that will, will be helpful, right, to real life. So Shelley, you and Andrew were both um, instrumental in forming Ikarvik, which Alex is a member of. This is a group that brings sort of young Inuit adults together with scientists to try to make the climate science better. Tell me why that was important. Well, I think it, it, it really came out of a, a place of frustration, seeing that, that high-priced consultants with, with no real understanding of what they were observing were coming in to to, to give information to decision makers. Now, ultimately, what I know as a human being is that climate change requires quick action. If we rely, as, as a lot of governments do, on the best available science for decision making, it means that you are then stuck in, in, a, in a system where you are waiting for the scientist first to identify the issue, come up with a hypothesis, find the funding, do a couple of years worth of, of field testing, go back to their lab, uh, do some analysis, write a report, get peer review. In that time, you could actually be getting meaningful information for decision making from the people that are actually here. And, and it's funny, it's, it's this kind of disconnect that happens where 
I don't think that, that, that people are fundamentally recognizing that what climate change solutions need is the best available knowledge for decision making. Um, in, in my role with the CARVIC, it's just been as simple as giving Indigenous youth the same thing that most of the people in the audience have had, which is time and space to become excellent at what you personally can contribute to the climate change conversation. So, you know, really simply, again, it's climate change needs answers quickly. And yeah. the best way to do that is to combine Indigenous knowledge and science and use the knowledge that, that's co-produced in, in order to, to address some of these issues. And, and that's the kind of science that Andrew's doing. So Andrew is out on the ice for a, a program called Smart Ice, measuring the thickness of the ice, where the ice flow edge is, like where the kind of fracture lines are, the ice leads are. Um, there's a whole vocabulary of ice that I didn't know about that I learned doing this story. Um, Andrew, from your perspective, are programs like Ecarvic and Smart Ice about making the science more accurate, or are they about making the science more relevant? Are they about making asking different questions? What what is the main purpose? Uh, for the research science part, it's being it's more relevant to that community because uh, that's what the community had asked for and was concerned about the conditions of the ice and smart ice is able to provide real time information for the community. And, and one thing we Inuit do is um, adapt and we've been adapting for centuries here up in the north where majority of the world seems that it's too cold for anybody to live up here, but that's proven wrong. And we are very capable of uh, doing research up here also and <clears throat> to have that community um, to listen to the community concerns is uh, I think it's a huge deal and you get a better outcome of your research and have better support from the community also. If I could just yeah. add something to, to what Andrew said, I, I think the other theme that's really important and not often considered is that Ikarvik in Inuktitut means a bridge, and we're focused on two-way capacity building. It's not just about enabling Inuit youth to be able to feed into climate change science, but it's also about training scientists how to work better with Indigenous people so that they can build the relationships to actually create more meaningful, relevant projects. Yeah, I mean, I think that's really interesting because there's often, again, like in the sort of prevalent climate reporting that we see, there's often kind of an idea of like the victim of climate change, right? Because people in many parts of the world where climate change is most dramatic are also often not the people who have caused the worst climate change. Um, and what I found really interesting being up there was learning like the extent to which, you know, as Andrew said, right, there, there's a capability there, there's a depth of knowledge that so the lessons can go, can go the other direction. Um, Alex, one of the things that is also a running theme in Canada's Arctic for sure is economic development because as the north warms, um, it opens up the region to more economic development. And businesses talk a lot about how important that is, how, how important it is like to create jobs for the kids that you're seeing every day, someday. How does the community weigh the pros and cons of economic development against the need to protect the environment, to protect the traditional Inuit way of life to keep the ice safe, as, as Andrew was saying. Within the community, there is a lot of holistic approach, uh, consulting with elders, consulting with hunters, consulting with, e with the women and children. That one word, sea ice, can be something completely different for you. It can be completely something different for us. Therefore, how do you connect the two to make sure that whatever's being communicated is understood. And I think, Shelley, what Alex is talking about is that idea of Inuit knowledge, which you tried to explain to me like many times. Do you want to take a stab at it from an anthropological point of view for our audience? What, what is the difference between yeah. Inuit knowledge and kind of the Southern scientific method? Right. Well, as, as a non-Indigenous person, I think I, I, I can speak for a lot of people when I say we have got it all wrong. We think it's this kind of like data thing that you go and like extract from Indigenous people and that's suddenly going to, you know, open our eyes and our minds to, to what's really happening. 
Inuit knowledge is also the way that you work together in order to get the answers. Um, I don't know about anyone in this audience, but in university, I never took Humility 101. No one ever told me that sometimes you just need to shut up and listen. Um, the, the way of working together requires you as a human being to, to figure out something a little different than what we, we've typically been taught. And that is to, to not come in with a fully formed idea of, of what the issues are, but instead to, to sit back and, and figure out how to be part of a team in all of this. Um, in, in terms of the economic development, though, just, just again to throw out something that, that may not have been considered is that research itself could be an incredible economic driver for the Canadian Arctic. The number of young, fabulous superstar uh, Inuit and Indigenous scientists means that all that money that typically flows outwards to consultants and researchers could actually be driving an incredible opportunity for jobs that don't require you to stop being fundamentally who you are as a human. And I think that is, is something, again, that when you're only perceived as a victim of climate change, the space hasn't been given to say, what if the economic development and the climate change crisis can, can, can work together to spur on a new type of economic development in the North around Inuit knowledge, climate change, and, and co-created solutions? With the war uh, in Ukraine, obviously, there's, there's going to be probably pressure to accelerate some economic development in Canada's Arctic as a way in part of asserting sovereignty over the region. Um, if you accelerate global warming in, in a place like Pond Inlet that's already facing very rapid change, right, the ramifications pre seem pretty significant. Andrew, you, you talked about a minute ago how capable uh, Inuit people are, certainly like the longest database of, of information about the Arctic is in their heads. How confident are you, though, that, that the community can adapt to the kind of stressors it's facing now? Because it's climate change on one side, it's economic development on the other. You're, you've kind of got it coming at you from both ends. <clears throat> well, it's another adaptation that we'll have to face. I'm sure um, there'll, there'll be challenges for sure, but we don't see them right now, but we'll see them later in the long run now. But we are very capable of being out here up in the north and doing what we have to do in order to uh, live, I guess. A Alex, we're, we're almost out of time, but do, do you want to weigh in on that one? Yes. So from the industrial era, uh, anywhere that's been you know, colonized or what have you, anywhere that the industrial area started, you had a 200 to 250 year head start, where within our small community, it's been probably when the whalers and the traders started to come here. That's when we started having, that's when we started to adapt. So as opposed to a 200 year adaptation to the modern world, our short time we're amazing at adapting to any situation. That does not mean we're, we can all be resilient at some point, but that means for whatever pressure that's happening within our, our community, you as a researcher or anyone coming to the North, you need patience to listen properly to any voices that we have concerned. All right, we're gonna leave it there. Thank you all very much. Uh, really a pleasure to see you again.